Good evening, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to a continuation of this fabulous video series on the possible origin of the Quran. Last time, we kind of hinted to you that there is ample evidence out there uh, that the Quran, as we know it today, originated from what we call Christian hymnal material. Today, we are going to talk about some of the initial academic reaction to the work of one of those scholars who pointed out to an Aramaic or Syriac origin. And uh, this scholar is uh, Christopher Luxembourg. And with me here, of course, is Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., you brought up, uh, you know, the work of uh, Christopher Luxembourg. And if you want to maybe show people wh which book we're talking it's about right and the title, if you want to read it for it's people. It's called The Syro-Aramaic Reading of the Quran. Please get it. If you do have a chance, it's on Amazon.com. Grab it. Get it. Keep it in your library because it's soon going to be out of print. Yeah. So, so tell us about the academic reaction to this. Well, not just this. I want to even go one for step further. I want to talk about the academic reaction to this. That's too. Because... This preceded that, and that's why Christoph Luxemburg had to do a pseudonym, and that's why you don't even see his picture anywhere. Right. I'll, uh, there is pictures of Goethe Luling. He, uh, when he did his cadastral thesis, uh, he got an opus eximium, which is the highest you can get in Germany for any mm -hmm. doctoral thesis, which should give him had given him an automatic professorship. He got did get none of it. He got thrown out of the university and was sent to obscurity for thirty years until. The, uh, the English version came out, and because of the English version, he now has been resurrected. Because you, and once you get into English, it gets all over the world. And that's one reason why we're doing what we're doing. Right. There is something about academia that they are scared to death of anybody that rocks the boat. They are scared of anybody that says anything that goes against the standard Islamic narrative. The standard Islamic narrative, when you put it, when you look in here, you can see there. No one wants to change that narrative, and I. And this is the question I want to come up with: Why is it that the Germans had to throw him out of the university? Why is it that Christoph Luxemburg has to uh, has to change, uh, his, change name. his name? Right. And why is it that no one has yet refuted Christoph Luxemburg's thesis? Yeah. I mean, what is it that these uh, gentlemen did all other than just pointing out that there is a possible Aramaic origin and they proved that their thesis actually sticks? Well, I asked this of Thomas Alexander and Thomas Alexander uh, said, you know, Jay, there's a real problem, not just in Germany. This is happening in France. It's happening in Britain. I know it's happening in Britain because I was part of it. I got censored. Uh, when I was there in the 1990s, I would go to university, university after university, and I would do all the debates for the Christian unions who are all being challenged by the Islamic societies on all these different universities. You name it, I've been there. I've been to the Durham uh, University. I've been to Oxford, Cambridge Union. I've debated on both those unions. I've debated in Manchester, and I've been all over London and King's College. All these places I have had debates, 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 until 2010. In 2010, I became an Islamophobe. Overnight, I was targeted as Islamophobe, a hate preacher. And immediately, as soon as I got those two names, no other university was allowed me to come in. That's all Muslims had to say. He said, oh, Islamophobe. Now, why is it Muslims are doing this? And why is it this is unique to Islam? There's no there's no Christianophobe or Hinduophobe or Sikhophobe or Westernophobe. We don't have any other phobes except for Islam. Right. That word only exists in Islam. What does that suggest to you? Well, I mean, it suggests to me, unfortunately, a uh, reaction, uh, weakness in defending many of these uh, evidence or thesis. And the only uh, drawback here or fallback, I should say, is to try to just shut, you know, the opposition completely. It suggests also exactly what you're saying, that there's something about what we're bringing to the table that they don't Irrefutable. want to they don't want to be in public. Right. They don't want to get out. You only censor something that you don't like or censor something that will hurt you or that will shut down everything that you believe in. And remember, the Quran is sacrosanct for all Muslims. Right. Without the Quran, there is no Islam. That's true. And, and um, but I read these books and, and, and the scholars and, and the authors never attacked Islam. There isn't a single attack in there. There's nothing phobic about it. Exactly. There's no hate in any of it. This is called textual criticism. 
Isn't that what has been done with the Bible since the 1800s? Oh, my goodness, Muslims always brag about Bart Ehrman and this and that. I mean, so we don't call it, you know, Christianophobic, you know. Is there anybody that's put death threats on Bart Ehrman? Did, did they put death threats on Wellhausen when he came up with the documentary hypothesis in the 1800s right. or the school in Tübingen in Germany, which came up with the whole historical critique of the New Testament and the Old Testament? Right. Has there been any death threats or any censorship of anybody that, uh, that started asking these questions? Is that done? Can you show me of any example where Christians are doing that or Jews are doing that for anybody that confronts the Old Testament or the New Testament? Of course not. And why would you do anything like that to, to scholars who are just doing their job? So this is unique to Islam. I don't know of any other area of research, whether it's in science, whether it's in the humanities, whether it's in the biblical studies, that where we have censorship and call people Islamophobes or Christianophobes, that just doesn't exist. In fact, it makes no sense to even use that phobic title because phobic means fear of. Yeah, I mean, it has to be a psychological code then. I mean, there, is there a treatment for this? What is the treatment for this? It's well, a diagnosis, you know? The treatment is read the book. Just read the book and rather than attack the person, attack the book. So I asked Thomas Alexander, so what rebuttal has been done to Christian or even this one, but I said, since this is more famous right now, what rebuttal has been there? He said the only rebuttal that he can find anywhere is basically attacking Christi Christoph Luxemburg. And what are they attacking? Ad hominem, basically. It's ad hominem, but what is it that they're attacking about him? He's they're not. attacking the fact that he is now uh, confronting the standard Islamic narrative. Right. That's the only thing they can come up with, and that his me opus, opus me operandi is not giving something in return. So, in other words, he's not replacing it with anything. And I'm saying, hold on a minute, he does. He's replaced it. He did, the title says it all. The title says it right there. This title, if you look at the subtitle, it says it very dark. These That's are right. Christian hymns. That's right. These are lectionaries. He has replaced, he said, this is the original text. So you cannot really attack him. So I said, there must be something more than that. They said, what they usually do is rather than even try to confront his material, what they do is they find one place where he has made a mistake or one inter in, uh, idea that he has made a letter wrong or they have got, and then they use that and say, therefore you can't trust the man. That's called nitpicking. And you can do that with any scholar. Absolutely. And it's pretty sad, really, because uh, you would expect the field of academia to, to allow you freedom to share things in a respectful manner, of course. Uh, I mean, I, I don't endorse the idea of attacking people and calling names. That's not what uh, the, this work is about. But to come up with wild ideas and try to back it up, what's wrong with that? Isn't that what research is all about? Yeah. Now, we get this all the time. Listen, yeah. uh, I remember sharing with you last night where a number of years ago, I got mutawafika mixed up with muatafika. I put that to mutawafika. Yeah. I said, instead of saying mutawafika, I said muatafika. Yeah. And I had a scholar, uh, a, 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 even a Christian, he was a Christian who shut me down and attacked me and says, how can you trust Jay? You, you, oh, every scholar makes a mistake. Uh, case in point. Uh, are the Muslims all over the internet right now are putting up all these videos against me because I said way back in 2000 that one of the most dangerous men of Islam was a guy named Zakir Naik. And I said that in the 2000, actually it was the 1990s. I seen this in 1997 when I said that. In 1997, he was our most dangerous advocate. He was, that was before we knew about Shabir Ali, before we knew about Adnan Rashid and all these other characters. Right. That was before Muhammad Hijab probably was even born. And Back there in 1997, you look at me, I'm quite a bit uh, thinner and I don't have a beard and I look quite a bit different. You need to put it in the context of where we're talking about. But they're saying, see, Jay is all, he's completely off the water. How can you trust anything he said? Because he said, Zakir Naik is the most difficult man. Well, this is typical of when right. you don't have any material, when you have nothing to confront the person, what they're saying, you need to then confront their image or you confront their character. Ad hominem is the words you used. That's and right. ad hominem is the only thing they have against Christoph Luxemburg. It's the only thing they have against Gunther Luning. Right. Can you see how much, how easy that is to do? So what I'm asking any Muslim scholar, if you have a problem with Gunther Luning, if you have a problem with Luxemburg, can you please write up where is the problem with his thesis, because what we want to do is I want to go through his thesis and I want to show you exactly what he has done. When you realize the steps he took to get to where he is at, confront those steps, then right. we will listen to you. And that's a good segue because next time we are going to talk about, I think it's uh, called the seven steps. The seven steps. Yep. That's, that's what we are going to talk about, which is the seven steps that Luxembourg used in his book. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you.